Okay, I'm now going to carry on talking about what the economic impacts of the measures I suggested yesterday would be. At the company level, I'm assuming the law passed in the referendum specifies that all new added value is the collective property of people who work in the company. Correspondingly, the majority of company boards would have to be elected by workers to represent their interests. Now, it's important to note that with this scheme, there is no expropriation of any current assets. All that happens is that future revenue, revenue which is generated after the referendum, belongs to those who create it. Shareholders can still own shares, they're not expropriated, but the value of these shares will fall greatly because likely dividends are not going to be very great. They'll only get dividends if the employees choose to give them dividends. Ideologically, the whole thing is presented as an assertion of natural rights. We who create the value should have it belonging to us. Well, what's going to be the effect on the stock market of the fact that dividends are going to disappear? Well, obviously, there'll be a big depreciation in share values. There would no doubt be an attempt at capital flight from the country, but this will be relatively small in total quantity, considerably less than the total initial valuation of the share capital within the country. Why is that? It's because people selling shares in UK company with the aim of buying shares, for example, in French ones, will make such big losses on the capital account that they end up with having very little money that they're able to take out of the country. It'll all appear as capital losses on there, on the accounts of those who hold the shares. There's not going to be any impact on real capital stock. All plant and equipment is still there. Nor is there even any impact on the money capital of, of firms. The cash balances of firms aren't altered. So they're still in a position to meet their bills and continue trading. Under the new management, obviously. What about future investment? Well, the firms which are now mutuals will depend primarily on internal savings. That portion of their bonuses which the workers voluntarily forego to fund new investment. Additional sources of funding might come from a restructured non-profit making banking sector, investment grants and loans from the state, um, this additional funding would in time come to be allocated in accordance with the social plan. And this provision of additional funding for investment would be one of the levers by which a planned economy could gradually be introduced. Now, obviously, an important factor in judging whether you could politically get away with abolishing exploitation is the effect it would have on pensions. Since pensions constitute a pensioners constitute a large group of non-workers who are currently paid out of various forms of surplus. And there would undoubtedly be a, a lot of scaremongering to the effect that if exploitation was abolished, your pensions will be threatened and therefore you should vote against it. So, since the viability of pension schemes would be threatened, there would have to be, within the Act abolishing exploitation, provision for the state to rescue all unviable pension schemes and to guarantee that all existing occupational pensions will still be paid in full. Now, you may ask, would this not pose an excessive cost to the Exchequer? I I'm going to show, on the contrary, it can easily be afforded. Now, what I'm giving you here 
is some calculations. Um, basically, I'm going to show that there's a, going to be a considerable surplus left over and it would be feasible to actually raise the state pension to 18,000 a year um, instead of the nine and a bit thousand it is at the moment. And this will be important for winning the votes of people who are near retirement age. We know that the average pension being paid out um, in Britain is about 18,000. That includes the state pension. The state pension is 8,500, that leaves 9.5 roughly coming from private sources or occupational pension sources. And there are about 12 million pensioners. Now, that implies that there is about 113 billion currently being paid out by occupational and private pension schemes at the moment. Now, the state has got to guarantee any shortfall in that. At present, the state pays out 48 billion a year in interest on the national debt. If interest payments are abolished, that becomes additional revenue to the state. Now, though a significant part of those 48 billion is currently paid out to pension schemes. So they had, the state's got 48 billion in the kitty that's no longer paying on the national debt, which potentially can, it can use to bail out pension schemes. But we know that the pension schemes have a significant proportion of their assets overseas. And if they are actually drawing in part of their revenue to pay pensions from earnings on overseas assets, these will initially be unaffected by the measures taken in Britain to, to abolish exploitation in Britain. So for a period, one could imagine those will persist. Of course, if the idea of exploitation abolition spreads to other countries, this money will no longer be available. On the other hand, you've got to see how much money is currently being paid into pension schemes as employee contributions and employer contributions. Now, I've gone through the government statistics on the number of workers in different categories of pension schemes. Uh, categories of pension schemes with 1% contribution, 2% contribution, etc. And it turns out that the mean contribution rate of adding employee-employer contributions is about 16% on current pension schemes. There is around 960 billion total employee, con sorry, 960 billion employee compensation in the national income. So that means that pension contributions are around 150 billion each year. If we take off the private pensions which have to be met, 113 billion, offset, add to that the offset on national debt interest, my estimate of the returns to pension schemes from overseas assets and the pension scheme contributions now, you actually find that even if the state were to guarantee an average pension to pensioners of 18,000, there would be a surplus of 115 billion. So there's no danger that the state would run into big costs on this. In fact, the, running this way, there's a considerable surplus. You may wonder what's happening to all these contributions. If at the moment pension schemes have a contribution rate of 151 billion, are only paying out 113 billion, where's the rest going? Well, it comes down to the horrendous inefficiency and rip-off character of the City of London. A large part of people's pension contributions 
end up being pocketed by the financial institutions and going out as bonuses to, to bankers, etc. All that gets cut out. Now, another factor is transnational firms. What are they going to do if they're no longer allowed to exploit people in Britain? Well, obviously, they can no longer they can't export their physical capital because a system of export licenses on physical capital could prevent that. But on the other hand, firms like Amazon would likely cut off their UK branches from their US computer systems through which the orders go. But that's not going to be a serious effect on the economy as a whole, because the likely effect is to help local high street retail trade and local internet uh, firms and deliveries. Clearly, there will be a halt to inward capital investment. There's no, no getting away from that. And there will be depreciation in the pound. But as I said in my first lecture, that's one of the things that a socialist government should be aiming for. Now let's turn to something which I haven't mentioned so far, which is aristocratic landed property. If you go back to the foundation of the Labour Party with Keir Hardy, getting rid of landlordism, getting rid of the monopoly of land held by the aristocracy was set as one of the goals of the party. And if you ask which class in society is least loved, it's clearly going to be the old landed aristocracy. There are around 1,200 old aristocrats in Britain who still own a third of all the land. Now, the land value in Britain is about 10 trillion. So these 1,200 aristocrats are holding land assets which are probably of the order of 3 trillion. And were they to lose their three trillion worth of land, there would be few share, tears shared by most, shed by most voters. Now, I said they hold the land, they don't own it. That's because their claims date from feudal times, when all land was the property of the king, and they were given a tenancy. King William I gained, gave feudal tenancies to his followers who conquered the country on the condition that they fulfilled their feudal obligations to serve as mounted knights in his army. You might think that this all dates back centuries ago and would have disappeared, but officially it still exists. Officially in Britain, all land belongs to the Crown. In a written response to a question by Andrew George MP in 2009, Bridget Prentice, Parliamentary and the Secretary to the Minister of Justice, replied, The Crown is the ultimate owner of all land in England and Wales, including the Isles of Scilly. All other owners hold an estate in land. Although there is some land that the Crown has never granted away, most land is held by the Crown, held of the Crown, as a freehold or a leasehold. So, the feudal principle still officially exists. So all the socialist government would have to do to achieve the historic socialist goal of nationalising land is to declare that the landed aristocracy have lost their tenancies because they're no longer leading, uh, giving the military service as mounted knights for which it was originally given and in consequence all their estates have reverted to the Crown. Arguably this doesn't even involve a, an Act of Parliament could, but could be achieved by an order in Council. And since there's no expropriation, just the termination of a tenancy, which they didn't own the land, there's no compensation due. Who ends up owning the land? Well the Crown Estate does. All these tenancies would revert to the Crown Estate. Now the nice point is that in 1760 George III handed the Crown estate over to the Treasury so it wouldn't actually belong to the Queen. 
The effect would be that all revenues that currently accrue to the aristocracy would then go to the treasury to offset taxes. Ironically, one could use an old feudal relic of the UK constitution to achieve the old radical objective of expropriating the aristocracy. As a matter of political expediency, since the government would be using crown power against the aristocracy, it might be politic to offer a small f fraction of the resulting revenues um, in an uh, augmented civil list to give the crown a vested interest in expropriating the aristocracy. Um, it's not the first time something like this has happened. A, a previous example was the nationalisation by Henry VIII of large parts of the, the land held by the church, which was greatly to the profit of the king, also handed out to his followers. In this case, you wouldn't be handing them out to other members of the aristocracy. It would go to the general treasury. Another large batch of property owned by the aristocracy was not granted in original feudal tenancies, but was made up of common lands that they seized from 1600 or so onwards, right down to the end of the Victorian period. So they were seizing land in Scotland down to the Victorian period. And there are some 5,000 and more private acts of parliament which enabled the aristocracy to seize the common land. It would be simple enough by a simple single act of parliament to repeal these acts of enclosure and clearance so that the land in question reverted to being the common land of, of local parishes and towns. Current value of land in Britain is about 10 trillion. It represents 51% of all UK wealth and this would then be effectively convert, uh, transferred to the Crown and local government. But it's obviously essential that under these circumstances the position of individual house owners, homeowners, be guaranteed. There's, no, there's going to be no question of people being thrown out of their houses as a result of the Crown asserting its um, ancient rights over the land. On the other hand, it would enable land rental to replace council tax as the basis for local authority funding. The advantage of land rent over council tax is that it's progressive, not regressive, the way the council tax is. High value land in expensive areas of, ca of towns or houses with a lot of land would pay more rent to local authority. You could, if you want, you could call it rates rather than rent, but essentially it would amount to rent. You'd need periodic revaluations every decade or so, and revaluations whenever think land or how or whenever a house was sold, the land wouldn't be sold along with the house. Another point is what's going to be the effect on banking of abolishing interest? Well, clearly the current financial model of banking, which funds itself out of interest payments, wouldn't continue. Credit cards wouldn't continue because then it would, they would be non-profitable. But debit cards would still continue as a means of payment. So payment systems wouldn't break down. Banks would have to rely on service charges to, to customers uh, for making payments if they can't charge interest on loans. So the banking system basically becomes a payment service rather than a system of extorting money out of the population in the form of interest.